Okay, go ahead. <laughs> thank you. So thank you and uh, good morning. I, I'm going to share with you some uh, um, uh, new results um, which relate to uh, several of the, of the topics of this conference. The, uh, there is a platform angle, uh, certainly a privacy and consumer data angle, certainly an economics angle. Um, this work is unpublished, um, although we are going to present it more officially and in full form uh, um, in a couple of at a couple of conferences in June. And the, this work is part of a, a stream of studies um, we have been trying to, to run uh, addressing this question. Uh, who really benefits from the data economy? This is a question that I've been uh, uh, grasping with and considering for quite a while. Because if you look at the um, uh, most of the current uh, debate over privacy, uh, you find often claims such as uh, these ones, which I'm alighting on the, on the left side of your screen. Uh, privacy concerns do not have solid economic explanations. We, we kind of hinted at that as a, as a more than as a statement, as a question in, in the previous panel. Is there actual harm uh, for consumers at the individual, not societal level? Or in fact, uh, consumers, after they realize the benefits that they can also receive from sharing their data, uh, should feel uh, no longer concerned about the privacy invasions. Free online services would not be possible without increasing collection of consumer data. We need this increasing collection, an increasing, increasingly sophisticated collection in order to sustain and foster uh, all the uh, beautiful and free content and services that we have uh, become used to obtain from the internet every day. Uh, sharing personal data is in fact an economic win-win. Everyone benefits. Uh, in the case of targeted advertising, for instance, that's good for merchants who can target the right uh, uh, consumers. It's good for consumers who see a reduction in search cost. It's good for publishers who sell more valuable real estate online. And it's good for the data intermediaries who make money from, the, from these transactions. In fact, loss of privacy is the price to pay for the benefits of big data. We have to give up privacy to have all the uh, wealth uh, originated from machine learning and analytics. Now, I'm not trying to be controversial when I state that uh, there is a thin red line connecting all of these claims, uh, and it's, uh, none, of them, none of them is uh, demonstrated to be correct. Um, it may sound like an aggressive or bold statement. Uh, it's not because I'm trying to use my words carefully. I'm not saying that they are demonstrated false. I'm saying that there is little proof that they are generally correct. In fact, if you look at the literature, we can find evidence of still very open and very important questions, which I can uh, um, uh, contrast to each of these claims. Uh, privacy concerns don't have solid expo economic explanations. Well, in fact, uh, we know that under, even from traditional microeconomics, without even bringing into, into discussion behavior economics, which is uh, one of my fields, even just using traditional rational choice theor uh, theory, uh, there are several scenarios where consumers may want to rationally protect their privacy. Um, and there are also scenarios where uh, more privacy protection is beneficial in the ag aggregate sense, in, pa in Pareto uh, terms, but not always. So we still want to understand better under what conditions privacy will be welfare increasing, under what uh, conditions privacy will be welfare decreasing for individuals and for society as a whole. When do consumers benefit from trades in their data? Again, uh, it seems to be a claim that what we are enjoying now in terms of free content and free services, just to quote an example, I'm sticking to the, to the online uh, advertising, online publishing ecosystem example for, 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 for the sake of discussion. It seems that these, all these benefits are due precisely to the increasing collection of data. But in fact, uh, we know not enough about uh, the allocation of uh, value that is being extracted from consumers. To what extent uh, the collection is necessary to foster the services we use? Uh, correlation is not causation. And some of our work will indeed uh, be about this uh, very important issue. And I'm going to show you some results in a few slides. Who bears the cost of privacy enhancing technologies? We do have, and we have had for nearly 20 years, uh, technologies which, so to say, allow us to uh, have the cake and eat it too. 
uh, from homomorphic encryption to anonymous credentials to differential privacy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Name an electronic transaction which is being done today in non-privacy preserving manner. There is some technology to do it uh, in a more privacy preserving manner. Now, wearing back uh, my hat as an economist, not as a technologist, I do know that there is also no free lunch. Whenever you apply these technologies to data, you are degrading the granularity and the value to some extent of the data. The interesting question as an economist is, if you are degrading that value by using private financing technologies, who is going to bear the cost ultimately? Is the consumer himself or herself? Is the society? Due to privacy and technologies, we cannot find a cure for cancer because uh, medical researchers cannot bridge these data sets in a new, fascinating way which finds something new and important in the data. Or the protection through technology is actually simply eroding um, profit margins of data oligopoly. So there are essentially here uh, different claims that can be made. But to me, the, 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 the lesson is that although the discussion on the economics of privacy often focuses on uh, what is the harm. And in fact, uh, uh, last night, uh, Luigi's question to, one of the uh, Luigi's questions to Chris Hugh was indeed, what is the harm? And that, that is a totally legitimate question to ask for economists. But I posit, I suggest actually, that there are equally important questions to ask, such as what is the benefits and how it is allocated? And if we start using different technologies, where will be the cost and what will be the change of the benefit? Okay, so kind of turning, turning the table and looking at the question in a different way. Uh, today, in particular, I will try to show you some early evidence from a study which tries to address this broader question. If it, economic surplus is being generated from data, and I do believe that it is, how is the surplus allocated? Who is extracting the surplus? And I will focus specifically in the case of uh, target advertising. I was mentioning earlier that the data industry likes to present targeted advertising as an economic win-win where everyone benefits. And I'm, going, I'm not going to repeat the rationale for why. What's interesting to me is that if you look at this issue of economic win-win in targeted advertising, just from the standpoint of theoretical microeconomics, or I.O. really, uh, you can uh, come up with very different frames. Um, under one frame, which is the one I believe the data industry uh, proposes, uh, there are consumers and publishers, and there are merchants. Merchants want to find consumers, consumers want to buy from merchants, and uh, the ads appear on publisher sites uh, facilitating these, uh, uh, these transactions. And the data intermediaries, by virtue of the information they have about merchants, about consumers, about publishers, act as matchmakers. They provide a service to everyone because they reduce search costs from both sides. Everyone is better off under this frame. There is another possible frame. Again, we have consumers and publishers. We have merchants. Now, consumers have a finite, and they are the data intermediaries. Now, consumers have a finite budget and attention. They cannot look at all ads all day. And they also cannot buy all the things they see on ads continuously. Publishers compete for consumer attention. And because of the proliferation of platform, this competition has become really, really, really fierce. Merchants compete very aggressively with each other because now the competition is such that a merchant online producing and selling um, uh, dressy shoes may be competing with a producer selling uh, fresh veggies and with a producer selling online uh, tickets. The competition is fierce. In the middle, I would argue, there is an oligopoly. I'm not dismissing the fact that the advertising ecosystem is extremely complex. It is. There are many, many players there. But essentially, there are a few players who are extremely powerful. They are the matchmakers and also the gatekeepers. So under this different frame, you would have different expectations about uh, where surplus is going to converge, or at least where most of the surplus is going to converge. So. Um, the study I was hinting at, the one that I'm, uh, I'm going to show just in very uh, re reduced form, so to say, is uh, part of a pretty vast attempt we have been undertaking um, around studying empirically uh, the value allocation in the data economy. So we have several experiments going on, very time consuming, because it's uh, one of the paradoxes to me of the data economy is that it is so untransparent. 
it's very difficult to actually find data about what happens in the black box of targeted advertising, at least for third parties such as us, academic researchers. In this particular study, um, my screen just went off, but I guess you can still see. Okay, wonderful. So you can still see. Uh, so in this particular study, what we did was to focus on uh, publishers, thank you, and uh, how much more do, thank you so much, do publishers receive, kind of what premium they receive when they sell advertising space which, um, which is behaviorally targeted versus when it is not, okay? Once again, we know that targeted advertising is uh, very valuable. We know that merchants pay a premium for that. And we know there has been much, of academic, much academic research on that, that targeted advertising is also more effective for merchants, increases click-through rates, okay, and conversion rates. There is debate on whether, there is an interesting debate on in, interpreting those metrics. I will not get there. The point here is that merchants do pay more. How much of that more goes to the publisher? So, again, theoretically, you can make two very different arguments. And, and you know what? They may be both simultaneously correct. Advertising willingness to pay increases when they can target their audience because that audience becomes more valuable. So advertisers, merchants, would pay more and publishers would get more. Or as uh, the targeted audience get, uh, shrinks, because the better you target, the smaller is the pool of people interested in this, the particular product, uh, then uh, we have a reduction in competition and uh, other price uh, decreases, the, the, the money spent by merchants and publisher revenue decreases. Or perhaps there is something, a little bit of both going on at the same time, such as uh, the competition, reduced competition argument doesn't apply really because, like I said earlier, merchants could be bidding on the same person, but for different reasons, because this person may be interested in fresh pages and in dressy shoes and in a flight uh, to uh, Brazil in a week. So maybe there is competition and advertisers pay a lot, uh, and yet publishers don't get that much. So uh, we leverage a data set which was shared with us by a very large American conglomerate, the owner of many uh, different online websites. And we try to estimate what was their delta, the margin, the increase in revenues, when in the visitors they received to their sites, there were cookies, which in fact could be used to behavior targeted ads versus they were not. So specifically we're focusing not on uh, targeting in general, because contextual targeting can still be done at the level of the page or the site, uh, contextual for instance based on the topic of the page, but we're sp specifically focusing on behavioral targeting. The one which requires cookies, requires tracking information across different sites. Um, these data came from 60 different websites, uh, over 2 million transactions. We had uh, lots of data about these transactions, the characteristic of the ads, the URLs where the ads were shown, the advertiser's name, basically the merchants who were bidding for the, and, and we need a bid for the ads, as well as whether there was cookie information or not. And we were trying to see how much the cook, the, the visitor with cooking is, uh, is more valuable for the publisher versus no cooking. Uh, now, for those of you with an economic background, I'm pretty sure that you already are worried about something, or you should we, self-selection, right? Because uh, to some extent, uh, the presence or the absence of a cookie may sometimes be due to the visitors on decision making. Not always, because in some cases it's the browser that makes the decision for the user. But in some cases the user may choose a browser for a certain reason, such as privacy protection, or may use cookie managers to remove the cookie. So we have a selection bias, right? Because maybe those users are also more or less valuable comparatively to other visitors. So we have to account for that. And this not being a randomized experiment, the only way we can account for that is this is observational data. We have to use uh, more sophisticated um, uh, econometrics, which is uh, the augmented diverse probability weighting approach. We basically estimate the probability the user will have a cookie or not, and then we estimate two different outcome models, one with, for transactions with cookies and one with trans for transactions without cookies. Then we compute the weighted means of the treatment specific for these outcomes, and we compute the average treatment effect. There are nice uh, there is desirable properties of this augmented uh, um, uh, inverse weighting approach. And uh, long story short, what do we find? We find that there is an increase in revenues for the publisher. But the increase is pretty small in our data. And this was robust to all possible 
manipulation checks we could throw at the data is 4%. So yes, there is a premium. It's pretty small. Now, it is statistically significant. Is it economically significant? Well, um, it is a 0 0.00008 per ad, which is better than nothing, obviously, because if a publisher is selling uh, many ads, many transactions on a day, that's, uh, that's money. Uh, but it comes at the cost, uh, the infrastructure, uh, potential liability, uh, compliance cost. There is the concern for user privacy. But furthermore, and here I'm bringing back the discussion to the big picture, how much of what the merchants are paying to buy targeted ads end up being at the end of the funnel going to the publisher? That to me is the interesting question. Now our study cannot fully address it yet because we only see this part of the puzzle, right? So right now we can only use anecdotal evidence for the beginning of the funnel. And when we use it anecdotal evidence, I'm quoting here from an article which was published very recently in the American Prospect, uh, in fact about uh, one week ago or so, um, stating that an online advertisement without a third party cookie sells for just 2% of the cost of the same ad with the cookie. Now, basically I'm asking you and myself to do kind of like a double negative here because th the way this sentence is phrased is saying that the, if there is no cookie, merchants are paying 2% uh, than what they pay when they actually buy ads which are going to be targeted with cookies, right? So the, the premium that the merchants are paying is very significant. The premium that the publishers are getting is 4%. 4, 4 now, big caveat, enormous caveat. Right now, this is an Apple and Origins comparison because this data here doesn't come from the same experiment we ran, right? So our next step, and if anyone in the data industry wants to <laughs> prove us wrong but wants to collaborate with us, is to triangulate, close their circle with an experiment where we play all the roles. We see the publisher, we see the merchant, and we can really triangulate the data. Right now, this is very interesting evidence. We want to close the circle. The second point I wanted to make, going back to the discussion of regulation, is that you hear often um, in the debate over privacy, the threat the perceived threat, the regulation will kill, uh, what's the English expression, the golden uh, egg? Good, thank you. <laughs> uh, you see this site, this citation comes from about 12 years ago. I could have chosen something just for the last few months related to GDPR. That's possible that these claims are correct, but if, and I stress again if, if we are instead correct that publishers get 4% more from showing targeted ads than, untarg than uh, uh, non behaviorally targeted ones, then this, raise, this does raise the question of whether regulations such as GDPR would have such a catastrophic effects on downstream availability of free content and services as sometimes some representative of the data industry seem to suggest. And I will leave you with this uh, open question. Thank you. Thank, th thank you, Alessandro. Two quick questions. Do you, um, wh where, where did you get the data from? I mean, can, can you tell us a bit more on that? Because I find it very interesting. And the other thing is, uh, do, do you already have perhaps preliminary results that could tell us whether uh, actually uh, who's going to bear the brunt of, of, of GDPR or perhaps privacy enhancing technology? So, um, thank you. Uh, about the first question, the, the, uh, the data comes from an American media conglomerate. Um, which owns uh, over 60 websites. Uh, the websites include, although I cannot name the specific conglomerate, privacy or in this particular case, uh, NDA, <coughs> what I can discuss certainly is the fact that the websites cover both uh, very high traffic and uh, moderate uh, traffic, moderate to low, not low in the sense of 200 visitors per month, but low compared to say New York Times or Wall Street Journal. And they include sites which are, could be called uh, generalist, that cover many different topics, and sites which are um, specific to uh, certain audiences. And the results seem robust uh, across the board. Uh, in terms of GDPR, um, I feel that so much has been said about GDPR, but the, honest, the only, only uh, honest answer I can give you is that no one really knows because um, I, the, the, the implications, the ramifications of an initiative such as GDPR will only be felt through not just months, but a few years. So we are in need of uh, empirical work, and full disclosure, I, as many others, are trying to do exactly that empirical work 
to, to understand what are the downstream implications of GDPR. For instance, uh, again, is it true that under GDPR we will observe uh, a, a reduction in the quality and in the quantity of content that uh, EU websites make available to the world compared to US sites due specifically to the reduction in the ab their ability to, to collect and track, track information. We are running exactly that experiment, so we are monitoring the data. And uh, only once we know more, then I will feel more comfortable making economist hat uh, comments about GDPR. The only thing that short term I can say is that GDPR acted as a, as a huge catalyst for discussion about privacy because we see changes now in, uh, in, uh, in the public debate even in the United States and we see uh, a number of organizations such as Facebook and, and Google making claims about privacy. To some extent those new claims and new stances may be due just to recent scandals. To some extent they may be also potentially be due to GDPR and the threat of regulatory intervention in the United States, the GDPR has also ended up causing. Thank you. Now to you, Dina. Um, you, you've been a um, technology entrepreneur and a um, advertising executive for 10 years. Now, now you've written a paper on the antitrust case about Facebook. And before you kind of give us uh, the rundown of that, tell me why you've written it. Why now? What, what, what's the motivation? Well, um, I was on the advertising side, the money side of all these markets, and I was watching how all digital advertising money, almost every incremental new dollar that enters the market, goes to Facebook and Google. And the stories and the fact patterns that I was watching seemed to me like classic antitrust fact patterns. and. Um, I think there's a lot of market risk and sort of black box risk with digital advertising markets. So I was also concerned about the industry from a macro perspective. And so I thought it might be a good, a good move to, to get out before any crash happens. And I just thought these were you know, terribly interesting questions that were going to be at the forefront of democracies across, across the world. Cool. So, um, Perhaps I'll just start by, by sort of narrowing the conversation of what's happening in these digital advertising markets. I think a lot of the, a lot of the antitrust fact patterns become very clear if you just follow the money and understand what's happening in digital ad markets. So when you go to a website and you load an ad, and by the way, we're, we're you know, we, we have this conversation about tech platforms, but if we, you know, tech platforms operate in different markets. If we narrow the conversation to Facebook and Google, we're really just talking about the digital advertising market. Um, Facebook made, I think, about 98, 99% of its 55 billion in revenues in 2018 from digital advertising. So these, you know, massive companies are just selling digital advertising. And if we now take a moment to look at how that market mechanism is working, these are mostly auction markets. So when you go to a website and you load a page in the milliseconds that it takes for the page to actually load, there are actually real-time auctions happening in the background where a decision is being made as to which ad should we show this person in this geolocation that is loading a page about, um, uh, let's say, uh, you know, a BMW review on the automotive section of the Wall Street Journal, right? So these are auctions that are happening. There are many different exchanges because auctions are run through exchanges that are run in the digital advertising markets. And um, these are not all independent exchanges. So you have some exchanges, but Google and Facebook are operating their own exchanges. This is important to realize because at least you know, with Facebook, for example, these are black box exchanges. They're running the auction rules. They're running the pricing rules. They're running the clearing price rules. They're running transparency rules. Or importantly, the lack of transparency and the lack of audit rules in these markets. And Facebook has not gone through a recession yet. And I wish I had the opportunity to, re to reply to, to Cohen yesterday. But, but you know, I've spoken to small businesses across America that have lost money buying Facebook ads because they buy ads. And there is literally no way to audit 
whether Facebook is delivering what they say they're delivering. You can measure sales, but you cannot actually measure whether um, you're getting the impressions, you cannot measure whether they're serving the advertising, and you cannot measure whether they're serving it to humans or bots. So controlling the auction mechanism is, is a reflection of not only market risk, but it's a reflection of monopoly power, right? So the Yellow Pages in the early 2000s was a monopoly, and you know there's two ways that a company with monopoly power can increase price. In the digital advertising world, they can either increase the side of the equation where it's the transparent price, but advertising is sold price per circulation. So you can increase price, or you can fudge on circulation or reduce audits on circulation. And I'm not just, you know, I mean, this is, this is significant. There's always like human actor risk when you have black box environments, right? And um, recently, Nelson Peltz took a board seat at Procter & Gamble, and the CMO at Procter & Gamble was under tremendous pressure to make sure that they're spending money wisely. And he took the stage and he put tremendous pressure on Facebook to open up to audits of their circulation numbers. And um, Facebook did, and weeks before some, the auditors came out with numbers, Facebook admitted that for the last two years they had been inflating video circulation metrics. You know, so, so we have a lot of empirical evidence on the advertising side of the market of these types of behavioral fact patterns. And if you go to advertising events, you have industry people on the advertising side of the market that are taking the stage complaining about Facebook's monopoly power in the digital advertising side of the market. They don't know what monopoly means, but they just know that their behavior in terms of audits is just an outlier. So, um, but, but let's go back to how these auctions work. So the, the inputs to clearing prices to these auctions are your user identity and your user data. Those are inputs into the auction model. They determine outcome pricing. So let, let me explain how this works. If you go to the Wall Street Journal and you read an automotive article or, you, you know, you read lots of articles about you know these nice cars the Wall Street Journal as a publisher can put you if they know your identity so the Wall Street Journal you know you're logged in but if they know but for other publishers they might not know your identity so they're reliant only on you know random um, variables that users can delete if they delete their cookies but um, they can put you into a, a bucket and they might call you an automotive intender so you're somebody that is in the market looking for an automobile, the value now of an impression to show you has skyrocketed maybe from a, um, you know, a $10 CPM to a $150 cost per thousand, right? So the value of that ad to you just skyrocketed. And that's because they know what you read, right? Okay. So now let's imagine um, the Wall Street Journal goes to the New York Times and says, hey, can we put code on your site? that will inform us what readers on your site are reading. Is that rational behavior? Would the New York Times or any publisher let a competitor in digital advertising markets do that? And the answer is, of course not, right? Like, that's their audience. If you let the Wall Street Journal know what New York Times readers are reading, when that anonymous user comes to the Wall Street Journal, they can now um, sell them an advertising at an automotive and tender price because they know the user was reading an auto article in the New York Times. Like, that would never happen. They are direct competitors in advertising markets. So why is it in digital advertising markets, you know, Facebook and Google are also direct competitors in advertising markets. So why is it that every publisher in America lets Google and Facebook monitor, track, and record what their audience is doing? And then, as part of the permission terms of these agreements, use that data to turn around and price undercut publishers and digital advertising markets. Because that is exactly what's happening, and that is exactly why money is going to only Facebook and Google, why they're able to sell the lowest cost advertising. They don't have to pay writers. They do not have to create content. And, um, and you know, so from, from, the, from the money side of the business, I just thought that these fact patterns 
or terribly interesting, and the answers really are because Google has monopoly power in uh, the, the, the ad server market, and Facebook has monopoly power as a social network, and they are able to demand the terms that they want. It's not pricing, but you know, if we want to, we, we, you know, we, we really need to understand the, the crossover between data and antitrust, because the data, the user data that these companies extract from a permissions perspective um, are an asset. They're traded on exchanges. You have data exchanges that just trade user data. They have tremendous asset and book value. So we can pretend all we want that like the terms that they're extracting from, it would be like, you know, it would be like Standard Oil negotiating extraction of oil terms from land, but then sitting around and saying, well, you know, that's an extraction problem. That's not an antitrust problem. If like, you know, it just skyrockets. Like it's worth, you know, it's the new sort of the oil or the new the new gold, but that's you know that's that's exactly what's happening. So, thank you, thank you, Dean Evan. Uh, I mean, I found your your paper quite interesting because it gives a an interesting narrative of how Facebook got to where it is now. And I no, don't necessarily agree with it in all points, but it was an interesting narrative and was new to me. Could you kind of quickly walk us through? How, how you see kind of the history of Facebook and how it became this monopoly, as you say. Sure. So um, I think that, you know, the papers, so I, you know, on the, on the money side of the market, you know, what's happening in terms of why every incremental advertising dollar is going to, to Facebook and Google is, be, is because they're extracting these permissions across the horizontal market, across competitors, to be able to track users, um, to track, to basically extract data from users as they move you know, through the through competitive properties on the publishing side, and so and so I thought, well, consumers can't like this in a democracy, right? So I mean, do, does anybody in this room today, if you sign up for Facebook, one of the terms is that Facebook is going to monitor what you read and record, what you particularly, and they're tying it to your identity at the social security number, like you can't break, you know, the identity match. Um, on over 8 million websites and mobile applications, what you read, what you um, type into mobile applications, if you're typing health data, um, what you watch, what you look at, what you research, does, does anybody in this room like that part of the exchange with Facebook today? Right, so I mean, I think this is the, you know, it's not even like, we don't need to prove sort of the good or the bad behind the data or the privacy stuff that's happening. Like we have, we have, this is the consumer preference, right? Like you guys can vote, you guys can choose what you want and what you don't want. And here the market's history with Facebook is really interesting. Because when Facebook entered the market and it had competitors to compete with, it was all about not tracking users after they left Facebook. I mean, they specifically promised, we will not use cookies to track you after you leave Facebook, full stop, right? And so this, is, this was in 2004, it was competing with MySpace, it was competing with you know, lots of other social networks. And in 2007, it, um, you know, anybody on the advertising side knows that this is the, the, this is the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. If you can accomplish this behavior, right, your margins just skyrocket. So, and you have this incredible barrier to entry. Um, so in 2007, it tried to do this, right? So we have like this a tremendous amount of empirical just market, market history. Like we can just look at the market history. So in 2007, it, it tried to do this. It tried to start tracking users on third-party sites, and consumers were outraged. They protested. They, you know, form, formulated groups. They um, started privacy movements. They led protests, and Facebook backed down, retreated, and the CEO of the IAB, Randall Rothenberg, said. I mean, look, free markets are working. We don't need regulation, right? So the IAB used the moment to say, we don't need regulation. Um, so, and, and Facebook, you know, apologized, and Zuckerberg called it a mistake, and, you know, this is terribly, you know, sorry. And so in 2010 and 2011, Facebook introduced 
um, sort of derivative Facebook products for other websites to use. And these products were like the Facebook login, the like button. The problem is, is any time, the way that these digital products work is any time a, a publisher or a third party puts a piece of Facebook code on their website, right? Facebook can change the way that works anytime it wants. So there was this huge conversation and huge debate, not only between Facebook and publishers, but also between Facebook and consumers. And they were like, hold up a second. You just did this in 2007. You entered the market promising we're, you're not going to do this. We are all choosing Facebook, which is a market that's going to tip to sort of one player, upon the understanding that you're not going to do this. But this looks kind of suspicious, because we're going to be giving you the power to now change it whenever you want, right? And so Facebook went on this incredible campaign explaining that these widgets and these like buttons and these, you know, the Facebook logins and all these products that they were putting on across the internet we're not going to be used for this purpose. We're not, you know, that we're not functioning for this purpose, and that, you know, they were, um, you know, they would only pick up what you're reading if you happen to click on the like button, but not if you're not clicking on it, right? So, uh, and it perpetuated this for years because there was a lot of media coverage and, and you know, publications that were holding Facebook to an, to account. So, uh, Google. This, this might be kind of strange for us to imagine today, but Facebook, you know, internally, and we know this from some of the confessions of former executives that have written books, was terribly concerned about Google's efforts competing with Facebook in the social network market. So in June of 2014, Google announced it would pull its social network orca. And coincidentally, in June of 2014, after 10 years of examples of a competitive market restraining Facebook's ability to now conduct horizontal surveillance of users, same month, Facebook announces it will now implement horizontal surveillance. And so all of those codes that were on publisher sites were you know, a sort of Trojan horse and they now, you know, changed the permissions, changed the way that they were going to work on the back end, um, changed the use permissions specifically that they could now use the data to price undercut publishers and advertising markets. And you know, nobody has any option. Publishers don't have an option. Their revenues are taking a hit. Users don't have an option. The market is consolidated to this to this winner, you know, take all outcome. And well, thanks, Dina. So uh, I'll, I'm going to ask the, the other two panelists now to react to what they've just heard, both from Dina and from Alessandro. Let's start with you, Ashkan. Um, great. Uh, first off, I want to thank you uh, guys for having me. This is kind of my, some, I think, uh, my favorite people in this space, so it's kind of great to be on a panel. Um, just a bit of a background. So I, I'm a technologist. I work as a reporter, as a policymaker. Um, I worked at the FTC on both the Google and Facebook and Twitter investigations in 2011. And then I now advise a number of policymakers on policy in this area, most recently um, helping to write the California privacy law, which I'll talk about, I think, in this context. Um, uh, I will say, you know, if you haven't read, so, so I've been excited about uh, Alessandro's paper for a while. And then if you haven't read Dina's paper, um, for an e kind of econ-ish pa privacy paper, it kind of reads like a uh, you know, a detective novel, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a storytelling with really good quotes about from the executives, and it reads really well. So I, I, I kind of urge you all to read that story because I think it's a strong story, and I think it speaks to not only the market power but the kind of the technological nuance of this stuff. The you know the um, role of the company, both in terms of what it's publicly said as well as some of the internal documents of folks have had a chance to read the leaked documents from this San Mateo 643 case describing kind of internal communications by kind of leadership and, and product folks at the company around some of these decisions. Uh, you know, some of the terms like reciprocity, if folks are familiar with the, with, um, the reciprocity policy requiring that folks that use the Facebook API for the purpose of getting access to friend graph, the social graph, and user's profile information 
um, uh, be required to essentially feed back information they collect to Facebook, right? So this is this idea that like if you're an app that collects, you know, uh, uh, collects information from the user, Facebook should also get information, that same information, uh, as part of the agreement. Um, that's explicitly discussed in, in those in those leaked documents. Additionally, um, there's conversations around uh, um, excluding like exclusionary tactics for certain players like Vine, and so there's a there's a there's a um, reference there where uh, I think Zuck specifically says to block Vine from the API with no reason given other than that they're a competitor to Facebook Video. And what's interesting about that, the way I like to think about that behavior is the key asset there that Facebook is providing is access to not only the user's personal information, but really the friend graph, which provides essentially virality. So if you're a startup and you're in the growth phase and you want to essentially grow a product, you can spend a certain amount of money on advertising in order to get people to see and learn about your product and then convert and download and install your product. Um, you can spend that money or you can use things like the social graph such that when I use the product, I then broadcast that use to my friends, and my friends then are exposed to it and increases their likelihood. And the amount of essentially influence, I think, that Facebook can extract by selectively allowing access or excluding access to competitors to this resource, I think, can be framed in kind of economic terms. So I think thinking about those, those behaviors vis-a-vis -vis Facebook and, and Google, I think it's a really um, key, key way to think about this stuff. Um, Briefly, is it worth me talking about the CCPA and how it works and how it kind of, I let's, think. Let's do that next. later. Like okay. In one of yep. the other rounds. Oh, what's, 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 what's your take? I mean, since uh, Ashkan is talking mostly about Facebook. Yeah, let me, let me say a little bit about Alessandro's amazingly interesting study. Um, I was nervous when you outed Alessandro for his motorcycle racing ha uh, history because in high school, I wrote a Honda Elite 80 CC, and I thought you were going to show a photo of it. It was, it was pretty embarrassing, and I flipped it one day, and it broke. But at any rate, um, that's the closest I've ever come to a motorcycle. Um, so I'm a law professor, uh, not a very good one, but I'm a computer programmer as well, and I'm a much better computer programmer than I am legal scholar. Um, I'm avowedly, though, not an economist, and I kind of consider it my cross to bear to walk into rooms of economists and tell them that they're doing privacy wrong. Um, and so that'll be my goal for you know, six or seven minutes, but I want to get to the Q&A. Um, so, so I think I, I have a long kind of litany bill of particulars I can lodge against law and economics and the way it's infected kind of privacy discourse. Uh, but let me, let me bore down on, the, on two of the results we heard today, because I think they do, in some fundamental ways, begin to strike at kind of core tenets, articles of faith that economists tend to bring to these debates. Uh, now, I don't think we've, we've kind of put those to rest, but man, the, the uh, evidence we've seen today is interesting. So let's start with uh, Lior's study and, and um, Jamie's study about dark patterns. I've been uh, going around as often as I can this year saying this is the year of the dark pattern. This mm -hmm. is the year where people like Senator Warner now have a bill that uh, uh, seeks to address dark patterns. I'll be speaking to his staff uh, at a public event next week about dark patterns. Jonathan Mayer at Princeton is doing some research, I think comparable to uh, the results we saw today. Um, and in a really interesting way, they really do strike at kind of the heart of what you heard echoed many times on the previous panel, the so-called privacy paradox. This idea that our revealed preferences betray what we really think about privacy. Uh, therefore, we should discount all the surveys and political Strum and Jong, we hear about the desire in a kind of general sense for privacy. And uh, the quip I like to say is that there's a privacy paradox paradox, which is why economists think the privacy paradox is interesting or something that we should be debating. Um, but the only response we've had for many years is that it has to do with kind of, you know, the lessons of behavioral economics and nudges and the idea that here you have the masters of information, people who uh, have made their entire lives in Silicon Valley manipulating choices using kind of tools that heretofore have never been seen in human history to control what people do uh, in a kind of communications environment. And so, of course, we shouldn't be surprised that uh, they reveal their preferences by doing things against what would otherwise be their interests. And so I think dark patterns to me, the reason it's such a, so it's not a new idea, but it's a really useful salient label that gives us something to use to debate with the economists, right? The idea that the kind of sleazy tactics that Lior demonstrated are not just sleazy, but also highly effective. Uh, and this is like 
two pencil necked economists, I mean, you know, uh, researchers probably with Qualtrics in a really ugly environment, um, still getting people to change their behavior significantly. So that's a kind of, you know, I think not mortal blow against the privacy paradox, but God, I hope we can talk about the privacy paradox a lot less uh, now that we have this useful shorthand. Number two, though, uh, is one that uh, I've already told Alessandro I owe a great debt to him because I've been asking this question for many years. I spent one year at the FTC as a senior policy advisor, uh, and while I was at the commission, as you all know, the FTC has a huge bureau of economics, so there's, it's, the place is lousy with economists, and so every time I would get an economist in my office, I would say, what's the proof that behavioral uh, uh, advertising is worth the candle? That this is you know, bringing something useful, especially to the publishers, but even to the marketers. Uh, and they would always cite to me kind of four or five empirical studies that if you closed one eye and looked at it sideways, maybe began to suggest that behavioral economics was a significant boon over contextual advertising. Uh, by and large, these were funded by industry because the only way to do this research is to get data from industry. Now, Alessandro has gotten data from industry as well, but come to the opposite conclusion. The principal researchers, and granted, this is 2012. I think there's been a lot of work since then. The principal researchers, I noticed, had a penchant not to list these studies in the academic research part of their CVs. It was always in the other work part of their CVs or consulting part of their CVs. Uh, and so we took it as an article of faith at the commission that you, know, you would hear from people like John Leibowitz and Edith Ramirez, people who were real believers that privacy was something that the FTC ought to take seriously and enforce. Uh, and yet they couldn't help themselves but to say in every speech about it, well, of course we acknowledge that there's a lot of value being created here, but here's why we ought to protect privacy um, anyway. So I think Alessandro's really, really, really interesting result uh, is the one that I've always kind of believed in intuitively, and I'm glad to see that there's now some rigor being brought to bear on it. Uh, four percent. I guess it maybe in Q and A we can debate whether four percent is significant enough uh, to justify the kind of significant harms to privacy. Uh, and I'm happy to talk a lot about what the significant harms are because I think they've been giving kind of a narrow and short shrift today uh, in some of the some of the conversations, right? Um, but to me, 4% really doesn't seem that interesting. 4% seems like something that might be an acceptable cost if what we're talking about is a way to protect a lot of human interests that matter a lot. Um, but rather than kind of drone on and on, let me just kind of give you my take on things. Uh, if I'm not going to look at this through an economic lens, what am I going to do? I'm actually going to uh, advocate for something uh, that isn't new in American privacy policy. So there was a day when we passed privacy laws without kind of incessant debates over what this will do to innovation. Uh, and instead, we kind of would rest our debates on things like human rights, uh, on democracy, on deliberative discourse. So we have something called the Wiretap Act. The Wiretap Act makes it a five-year felony. You'll go to prison for up to five years if you acquire the contents of someone's spoken conversation through telephone, through a hidden bug in the room. Um, it is a draconian and expansive bill um, it is a law. It is a law that is aggressively enforced, and I know this because I was a computer crime prosecutor at the Justice Department early in my career, and one of the things I did on the beat was I prosecuted wiretappers. Um, it affects all of the kind of quote-unquote online innovation that you see. The innovation in our current economic environment exists uh, in spite of the Wiretap Act, and the Wiretap Act does mean that on the margins it's harder to build something like the Amazon Alexa, because you've got to believe that when Amazon was first posting, uh, proposing something like that, one of their lawyers wrote a long memo that said, OK, here's how we're going to avoid going to prison for five years. Uh, yet innovate we did. Um, and so we write these kind of broad, sweeping uh, laws that are not kind of scalpels that try and maximize all the innovation possible while, while uh, preserving a tiny bit of privacy. We take a meat cleaver out instead, and we hack a line in the sand, and we say, sorry about the mixed metaphor there. We say, here is where we are going to separate x from y. Here's where we're going to make it difficult for information uh, to cross a particular context. We've done this again and again. We did it in HIPAA. We did it in FERPA. We did it in COPPA. I'm willing to uh, defend all of those sometimes unpopular laws. And I think there are still gaps in that approach. Uh, and so for example, we don't have a right to location privacy law in this country. It's crazy. It really is crazy when you consider uh, the real harms that befall people, uh, and there are kind of a litany of stories I can tell you about the harms from someone knowing your precise location that you did not want to know. Uh, we don't have a right to biometric privacy. The center I'm affiliated with, a 
um, the, the Center on Privacy and Technology at Georgetown, did yet another landmark study today, I had no part of it, uh, about facial recognition and the way it's used by law enforcement. If you haven't seen the study, I urge you to look at it. Woody Harrelson uh, figures prominently in one of the results. Okay. Um, so at any rate, that's a law we ought to have. And so although I appreciate, and we'll get into this in Q&A, the attention focused on the GDPR and the CCPA and Oshkan's work on that uh, law, I also think there's room for old-fashioned sectoral privacy law, uh, but it's only going to work if we can shuttle the economists out of the room before we write it. Thanks. <laughs> 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 So, you as a non-economist, yes. how, how do you explain the uh, targeting paradox? The privacy paradox? The targeting paradox. Which is? not worth much, why are people doing it? I think that uh, Alessandro has already explained that, right? And so I'll try and play an economist if you'd like me to. I mean, there's an economic answer to it, which is, and I believe this at the FTC as well, although not official FTC policy, you have this oligopoly of snake oil salesmen, they call themselves the ad industry, um, and the ad industry has convinced both of the sides of that market, that two-sided market, the people buying ads and the people placing ads, that they are creating value. And if you've ever seen the famous kind of growing taxonomy of the players in the ad targeting market, these are companies that exist for a hot second and then disappear. Um, they are masters at convincing both sides that play into technological insecurity, information asymmetry, um, that what they're selling is a valuable product. And they protect the information so we can't study it in the way Alessandro has. Uh, and so my like, creeping suspicion at the time was, this is a complete waste of money that is going toward nothing but like buying yachts for ad executives. And, or not even ad executives. I, I could sleep better if that was it. Ad network executives. Uh, and I think we're going to see over the years that, that part of that story is true. I'm sure it's not true exactly in the stark terms I just described it, but I bet a lot of that story is true. Alessandro, your explanation of the targeting paradox. Um, we have uh, perhaps not as a, um, a strong language. <laughs> uh, I, I, I find it a, uh, an interesting empirical question because what we are showing is uh, at the end of the funnel, um, there is, uh, at least in our data, yeah. uh, very small, uh, very, very little that eventually makes its way to the publishers. But we also know from at the end of funnel data that there is uh, a significant premium that merchants are paying for the type of ad. So something, if we believe this data, these results, and if temporarily accept the, the premise of, uh, um, of the uh, I just made, of merchants paying much more for targeted ads than untarget behaviorally untargeted ones, then clearly something is remaining in the middle. The next step, which is the one that I really would like to address, is where exactly in the middle? Because uh, the advertising ecosystem is quite complex, and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's also a black box, as was mentioned earlier. So I, I, I repeat my, I wouldn't call it a challenge, it's really a request or invitation. If anyone from the data industry wants to prove, prove us wrong, come forward, share data with us, let's do a study where we can really follow how one dollar spent here uh, ends up uh, reducing, going to you know the surplus of these different uh, intermediaries, and eventually reaches the publisher. Mm. Then we can have uh, we can uh, finally answer your question. Yeah. And Dina, what, what's your take? I mean, do you, do you also think that this entire ad tech industry, and you've worked in it, is is a complete waste? It's not. Well, I mean, um, which part were you in? I don't you know, even know where you were. I, I worked for WPP. I don't know what that Facebook's is. Facebook's largest buyer. Okay. Yeah. They were the big. I'm sorry. They're, they're the largest ad holding company, okay. ad, ad agency. So um, I, I'll just say two things. First, look, Facebook went public in 2012. They have not gone through a recession. 100% of the revenues that Facebook went public on do not exist today because they've rolled over their product. So we do have this problem in the industry of, you know, you know, they had this product, they went public, they had all these revenues. Oh my gosh, it doesn't work. We need to roll it over into something that we now tell our customers does work. And so you, you do have this, it's a legitimate, legitimate concern. I mean, also like all the big data in the world didn't predict that Trump was gonna get elected, so what, right? Um, yeah, the other thing is that, um, what was I gonna say? Facebook bit, targeting bit, that's about it, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, as, since you, I mean, we're kind of talking about Facebook. 
So, so I went to the Facebook developer conference a couple of weeks ago, F8. Yeah. And as you've probably all heard, kind of the, the, the big deal was of the, uh, Zuckerberg telling us the future is, is private, which I found kind of interesting after having told us a couple of years ago that uh, future as we know it, no, uh, privacy as we know it no longer exists. So uh, uh, Ashkan, t tell me, what do you make of this pivot to privacy? I mean, is, is this uh, something really go real going I think on? Is uh, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, and just to kind of, uh, just to an answer the earlier question as well, you know, I think of, I think it's important to, 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 to separate contextual and behavioral advertising. Um, but I do agree with Paul that essentially behavioral advertising is essentially like, you know, the blockchain without the cryptography, <laughs> right? It's like, a, it's, like a, it's like a speculative market that everyone thinks is going to, you know, yield this huge result and, and we don't know. Um, the interesting thing, so, so Facebook's pivot to privacy and, you know, I, I, I have a lot of kind of beliefs on why that pivot exists. Um, but uh, one of which is, is you know, any, in, in, in California, any kind of uh, Silicon Valley exec that goes, goes to China and comes back suddenly decides they need to create WeChat. WeChat and KakaoTalk and all these kind of chat products are essentially the largest growing market um, in Asia. And this is something that I think Facebook has said publicly. And so it's kind of like, you know, the scene where, where the guy's like, I think I'm taking crazy pills. It's, it's fun watching the F8 keynote around privacy. The immediate keynote developed at the F8 conference, the immediate uh, talk following, which is also public, is the um, head of marketing, sorry, head, head of messenger product that goes through, and I don't know if you've watched that talk, but um, she goes through and talks about all the features that messenger will provide to businesses. Right, and so the kind of this guise of the pivot to privacy, which I think speaks to Dina's paper, Facebook has announced that they're going to encrypt, similar to what WhatsApp does, end-to-end -end encrypt messages between consumers, and that's their pivot to privacy. And and a lot of folks are re reading that as they're going to encrypt the entire platform, and consumers can have privacy uh, from kind of from on their newsfeed. Um, my understanding is it's not that, at least uh, based on the developer conference. What they're doing is essentially. Um, Encrypting messages so that when Paul and I speak on the platform through a messenger product, um, those messages are encrypted end to end. Um, there will still be some filtering and uh, kind of um, ways to uh, detect problematic content on the endpoints. And there's a talk, there's another talk at F8 that describes what kind of what um, signature based uh, techniques they might use on the end and, and machine learning techniques they might. Uh, uh, use at the end. But the thing that I think is missing from every the debate is that um, right now, if today, if you open your browser and you, uh, or your, you know, your, um, your, uh, phone, your Facebook app and you connect to say facebook.com slash united, which is the United Airlines page, or any business page on Facebook, um, what ends up happening is you're immediately put into a chat with that business. So a uh, business pops up and says, hey, oh, some of them are automated chats where the business will pop up and start talking to you. Some of them, just the chat window is open and you can do things like get flight status or interact with the business. Um, announced at F8 is that you'll also be able to do things like shop and have a marketplace with the business and actually interact and do commerce using uh, what Facebook is going to provide a payment rail, a payment system as well to do commerce for, for businesses. And what's interesting about that is that's actually way more privacy invasive than exists today, right? So right now, if you visited the um, United page on Facebook, they would get aggregate analytics about their visitors, like the age of their visitors, but only, they don't get specific IDs. Similar, if you visited the United website, they get things like your cookie ID and your location, but if you've never visited the website before and you don't have a login, they don't get any specific information about who you are. Now, moving <coughs> forward uh, with this pivot to privacy, when you, vi when you visit a business's page and this chat dialogue uh, pops up, the company receives your public profile information, which is your name, city, age, picture, right, which is actually more information that they would have received previously without that chat. And more importantly, Facebook has no uh, responsibility or, or ability to moderate the content that the business makes, the representations the business makes to, to consumers. And for example, at the FTC, a lot of the things that we were interested in were things like when companies make deceptive statements to consumers, showing nutraceutical ads, showing uh, you know, problematic um, paleo lending and, and those types of representations. And that they've essentially cut off that ability or, or that need to do quality control on what businesses say to consumers while simultaneously 
giving uh, more insights about the consumers that visit the business to the business uh, and, and doing it under this privacy pivot. So I think it's kind, of, it's kind of a really smart move. And it's all done in a first party context in the sense that I'm conf when I interact with Paul or when I'm interacting with United Airlines, to me as, as a consumer, I'm interacting with the first party, which is Facebook. And the, under GDPR and under um, the California law, there's some kind of, I think there will be some clever interpretations on whether consumers know they're interacting with a third party business or not, or if they're interacting with a, a, you know, a United Airlines chatbot, right? Um, if I can um, um, expand on, 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 I believe, a very important point Ashka made and, and connected to uh, something Florencia was uh, saying in, in the previous panel when she was very kindly referring to some research we did in, uh, with Stutzman in around 2013 or so. Uh, the title of that particular paper, which was a study of uh, public disclosures on Facebook, was uh, Silent Listeners. Uh, so basically, we, we, we were trying the reason why we ended up with the title is the following. We were studying how public disclosures on Facebook evolved from 2005 until about 2011. And, and we found that uh, people, indeed, over time, were taking more and more steps to protect their information. They were decreasing less and less publicly. So they were u making use of privacy settings. However, over the same period of time, uh, the amount of disclosure that over overall they were making, and sensitive disclosure in particular, increased uh, enormously. Because in 2005, Facebook consisted just of a few static fields, hometown, uh, interest, uh, and so forth. By 2011, there were all these third-party apps collecting data, many more fields, many more ways for which uh, um, users of Facebook could disclose information. This is an example, and I'm not claiming that this was intentional, because I'm, I'm interested in, in the downstream behavior analysis. This is an example of a somewhat of a misdirection, or, or a dark pattern, if we want to use the modern language. We, we, were, we were not using the term at the time, but it's a misdirection in that uh, I can give you privacy settings so that uh, your uncle will uh, not see this particular photo, or your grandmother will not see your status update, or your employer will not see this particular piece of information uh, that you have posted. But in doing so, I'm channeling your attention on your grandmother, your uncle, your, your, your employer, and I'm uh, putting into the background the fact that I, Facebook, keep monitoring all this information and keep collecting it. It's a very effective misdirection. Again, I'm not saying that it's intentional. But it works, because people are trying to protect their privacy, but in fact, they are disclosing more and more sensitive information to third parties which brings up uh, the point related to the privacy pivot. Only time will tell whether it's, uh, it's a real pivot and it's uh, truly honest and, uh, and genuine, or whether, again, intentionally or unintentionally, I have no, no, no comment, no, no view on that, we end up putting the attention only on certain things which can be protected, such as the end-to-end -end encryption of messages, yeah, and reduce the attention on all the other data collection that is happening, which Ashkan was referring to. Yeah. And the, can I say one uh, thing? So, so <laughs> I think, OK, so if we actually explain what's going on, and we take the WhatsApp example, right? Because when Facebook talks about privacy, it's talking about the encryption of the communication between node A and node B, right? But the metadata around that communication right. is not private. And it is not making that data private. So let me, let me explain what this actually means, right? So if you use WhatsApp, encrypted end-to-end -end communication, Facebook's privacy pivot, pivot, right? And you make communications with WhatsApp. I think um, a news publication explained this in sort of a, a very clear way a number of years ago. But they said, OK, so what that means is Facebook knows that you're standing on the Golden Gate Bridge and you have just called your doctor. They know that that conversation left, lasted two minutes. They know that you then called your psychiatrist. They know that that conversation lasted one and a half minutes, and then you called a suicide hotline, and that conversation lasted 60 minutes. So that is Facebook's definition of end-to-end -end encryption and pivot to privacy. <laughs> they don't know what you told your doctor. They don't know what you told your psychiatrist. They don't know what you told your, the suicide hotline, but they know that that whole picture just happened, and that is 
Facebook's pivot to privacy, which is front page news. Can I very yeah, efficiently yeah. speak up for yeah. Facebook? I've never done this in my entire career. <laughs> um, I'll start by saying I'm skeptical they're going to get to the full, fully realized vision because of what all the pundits are saying. This is kind of incompatible with the business model, right? Although Washcon has a way, it's not. But I will say that privacy is multifarious and there's lots of ways of talking about it. There are some downstream benefits to privacy if they could achieve the full vision, especially of what Zuckerberg said in March, less so what they said at F8, right? Because part of the premise here is Facebook will become less public by default. We'll have fewer moments where it's you talking to 4,000 of your friends and more moments where you're encouraged to hole away in a small group and share intimacy and share confidentiality and I still believe there's an age-old debate in legal uh, scholarship about content versus non-content um, and whether or not privacy law ought to treat those two differently. And I've always come down on the side of saying, yes, both. They're both really sensitive and important, but I still do think content is pretty precious uh, and, and has the capability to cause you great harm. So if Facebook really is blinding itself to all of your content, I think that's not a zero you know, victory for privacy. I think that might be a net improvement. I don't know if they're ever going to get there. From a money perspective, like from the ad market right. perspective, that has zero But I'm, I'm less right. concerned with that. I'm more right. concerned with what are the harms that are going to befall people from their use of their service, right? So and to me, I think there's a story to tell where Facebook becomes net net a little bit more privacy protective so, with this uh, new model. Two, two things. One, um, with one exception that I flagged uh, in 2014 that generated a bunch of lawsuits, this is uh, the clicking on the hyperlink? Or? This is on the monitoring private chats. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they, they were monitoring when, when if, if yeah. I messaged to Paul and I said, I love United Airlines, United would get a like count yeah. uh, based on that communication. Uh, outside of that, they were not, my understanding is they're not monitoring private chats for the purpose of ad serving. Sure. Um, two, uh, to kind of Dina's point, the metadata about me interacting with United Airlines in my example tells you that I like air travel. And so if another airline wants to advertise to someone that's interested in air travel, right, right um, that metadata is still available. Um, so it still provides like a, a decent uh, ability to profile. The thing that I think is most telling about this conversation, and I want to go back to um, Paul's example of the Wiretap Act. So, um, and I've used this, you know, I use my testimony, I've talked about this a number of times. How many are familiar, how many have you heard about, have, have seen news stories or podcasts about Facebook monitoring your uh, private communications. When you say something, you know, the microphone is on and suddenly you get an advertisement for something you just said. How many have heard that anecdote? It's floated around kind of for the last three or four years, I think. Um, I have, for a number of folks, tested that um, pretty intensively, including like decrypting pin keys and figuring out how to kind of create a methodology for monitoring that, um, you know, kind of not tied back to me. Um, and I have not found evidence of that happening, of the fact that I literally instrumented a phone that any time the microphone, uh, the operating system would tell me any time the microphone was ever touched by the, by the software, any software. So I've done some tests to do that and you can't ever be sure. But what I think that tells you is that um, to the degree that people believe that the insights available from kind of this, this metadata, their browsing activity, their, act, their activity on the platform, seems like insights that could only be ma made available from monitoring a private conversation, right? Maybe that thing should be protected like the Wiretap Act, right? So like you don't need to monitor people's conversations to, to make those insights. They seem so in intimate, so intuitive, so, so, uh, so compelling that people only believe it could be those insights were available through the monitoring of the microphone. I think maybe we should consider uh, protecting that, that, that uh, uh, that, uh, that exactly. we, we have 15 minutes left, so let me open it to the audience. Matt, let's we'll start with you. So thank you, and this was an amazing panel. Um, I'm incredibly impressed with all of, all of your work. Uh, so I have a question for you. Next week, the Senate Judiciary Committee, Chairman Lindsey Graham is gonna be holding a hearing on concentration in ad tech. And I know there's been this discussion at the Federal Trade Commission about using their, uh, their authority to collect information about this ecosystem to try to do a study um, of advertising, online advertising, or various other tech markets. 
And um, the FTC actually has the authority to get the data that you're looking for. And, um, and then congressional committees can also get the data uh, if they really want it. So my question is, and I, and I guess this is more for Alessandro, but feel free to chime in otherwise. What should they ask for specifically? What the, the Senate Judiciary Committee, House Antitrust Subcommittee, the Federal Trade Commission? Uh, it's, it's a great question. Uh, I was not aware, uh, I had heard about a meeting, but I was not aware that it would cover specifically this angle and the, 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 the potential ability to um, uh, compel disclosure of this information. So um, my answer would be a little bit more general than I would love and probably you expect. Uh, I would love to continue the discussion offline. And the general discussion is the following, that um, the general answer is the following. I was mentioning earlier, I believe, that there is this paradox of the transparency and that economy being so opaque. Uh, Dina was also pointing out uh, scenarios where businesses, small businesses, are not sophisticated enough to know whether the ads they are paying for are actually being shown to bots or not, right? So we generally need much more, much more transparency, not on consumer data, but on what happens once the consumer data enters this uh, large black box. So in practical terms, in specific terms, I'm afraid that I'm not answering directly your question, but in general terms, I believe that if we really believe that the world should be more transparent, we should start from the data industry and provide information about uh, what are the flows of information and what are the flows of money. Uh, we have the technology nowadays to do it, meaning that you can imagine, and as a reviewer for several privacy conference on the technical side, on the computer science angle, there are, there are so many protocols that have explained how to attach metadata to personal information so that you can follow, you can get into real attribution. You can really follow the life cycle of information through all these different databases. So it's not a technological problem. We have the technology for that. It's a economic incentives and compelled disclosure problem. Sorry for us, it was a little a general answer. But. And, uh, and real quick, one of the fascinating things about this space, so folks know this idea of like, there's trackers online tracking you everywhere, you know, for advertising. Um, what's fascinating is those numbers have grown, the number of trackers kind of that you encounter on a website. And part of it is for behavioral advertising, sure. A lot of it is that nobody in this industry trusts the other person, hmm. right? So if I want to place an ad, I also want to place my verification service and my ad fraud service. Right, so everyone in the chain pulls in double verify or they provi pr pr provide another analytic service or a conversion tracking service to figure out attribution and conversions. And so everyone is measuring everyone else. As a result, consumers' data is going to like hundreds of places, but no one trusts one another uh, uh, in this ecosystem and is constantly trying to figure out, is it a real, bo you know, is it a real bot, is it not? Um, last week, I think Facebook announced something like 580 million accounts were shut down in the first quarter of 2018. Right, as a result of, uh, of you know, of fake fake accounts. Right, there's like all the advertisers that pay to advertise to those fake users. Right, like it's not clear, you know, how many of those ad how many ads were shown to those users, whether those active users. But all those advertisers want to know whether those ads were seen or not, or, 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 or and whatnot. So it's kind of a fascinating industry. Next slide. Um, hi. So first, yeah, I agree with that the panel is on fire. Um, I just had a quick question basically about, so that 4% number is fascinating, and, and you do point out uh, at the fact that there are, you know, countervailing issues, you know, what, what are the costs in privacy, but we could even look at direct economic costs to publishers, right? The traditional publishing model is that you build up an audience, you control that audience because they come to you and you sell to advertisers against that audience. But now when there are third parties involved, especially in the bidding system where there are hundreds of, if not thousands of third parties seeing that data, even if they don't get the ad, they see the bid, right? And therefore they can track that audience. Those people all have the publisher's audience. They have a copy of it, which they can target elsewhere. That means the, the publisher is no longer monetizing that audience in full, they no longer have control over their own audience. Um, that's probably worth more than 4%. And I was wondering if you, if you had been thinking of ways of measuring 
the impact of basically audience theft by Google, Facebook, and a whole host of third parties, um, you know, in a context in which local news is dying and it's all that. That's a very interesting angle. He adds one more, one more wrinkle. We have not tackled that yet, so uh, I apologize again. The answer will be a little brief, but it's something else that goes into the list of studies we want to run. We, we have one study now about, uh, well, a couple of studies about the impact GDPR had on publishers. Um, but this particular angle was novel, and I would be interested in studying the two. Good, thank you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And there's, there's two versions of that, right? There's ability to know when the audience, the individual that's targeted on the high, kind of the high content site, like the New York Times, is targeted on the lower CPM site. So like, you know, Paul's blog, no offense. Hey. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there's the other version, which is what, ver what number of the audience target that identified on the New York Times is then targeted by the platforms on service, like on Facebook or on Google, right? So there's two versions of that. Um, so on the mechanisms of market power and remedies, the German uh, Competition Authority earlier this year found that Facebook had been uh, uh, exploitatively gathering data, just as you described, by aggregating across Instagram and uh, its own site, but also the sites uh, that are visited by people across the web. And that this was done without adequate consent, and they imposed what they called uh, an internal divestiture. Um, so I don't know if you call it a behavioral or a structural remedy, it's one dressed up as the other. Um, I'm interested in uh, putting aside, the, you know, we don't have that way of approaching antitrust law here, putting aside the question of what is a competition authority doing enforcing data protection law when the data protection authorities are not doing it. Right. I'm very interested in your views on the efficacy of this as a remedy, uh, a much lighter kind of uh, political cost to impose uh, in preventing the aggregation of that data. What does that do to Facebook's business model? Does it uh, weaken its incentive to, to, to hold these three uh, together? What does it do for competition? You know, for yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, I think that this is the most effective remedy, right? So if you look at the market's history and you understand that when Facebook faced competition, I mean, it's, it's gathering, it's, it's unifying data not only from Instagram and WhatsApp, but also literally from over 8 million other properties, right? So if you look at the market's history and you understand that this, this looks like a monopoly rent, right? So for 10 years, the market Competition did not let Facebook get away with this behavior. So it's a, it's a terribly effective remedy to either automatically opt users out of that horizontal framework, right? And it simultaneously you know, fixes part of the problem for publishers as to why their inventory is getting depreciated from a pricing perspective. And you know, we can angle in from you know, econ theory and say, okay, well, if users are not being watched, output is probably going to increase, right? Um, I, think it's, I think it's terribly effective. But I, worry, I worry about enforcement, though, right? That's going to be very hard to police, uh, especially when you think about the complexity of data in a kind of modern company like that, right? So, and I think you made this point in your paper. I don't think so. They just have to, like, remove the, the, the user stable ID, like, from Yeah, it. but they're spread throughout, like, how many different tables and how many different, you know, cloud centers. But they did this for, like, we have four plus, years Plus, plus, as you say in your paper, they're also going to derive a lot of the value in the models they build. And then they'll say, that's all we're going to do. We're going to do that first step. We're going to build the model. We'll never touch that data again. But the, the, but data, the, data, the data lives data, within the model. As but you, the data has, yeah. so data in advertising markets has like a six-month shelf life. Yeah. Right. Literally, six-month yeah. shelf life, and it's done. Yeah. So yeah. they have to continuously know, you know, did, are you in the automotive market I'm not saying today? it's impossible. I'm just saying it raises, yeah. like splitting the company in two and watching what happens at the interface not that I advocate for that. I actually think that's not the right remedy. But the for problem privacy, with that but, is if you split. But the that's company, a lot. That's a lot easier to observe. You've made the enforcement. Uh, but you don't better. fix any of the problems. I, right? I, so I just said that. I said that's not yeah. the remedy I want. Except enforcement is easier. Right? Can, can I make a yeah. plug? So the California law has a bunch of provisions, right? So there's a the right to know, right to delete, right from some data security with a private right of action. The key operating piece of the, the California law is the right to say no to the sale of your data. And what that essentially says is that you can tell a company, a first party, a publisher that you're interacting with, that they can use the data on a first party basis for advertising, for contextual advertising, as in Alessandro's paper, but it restricts the ability for the, the first party to share data with a third party, to for, say, fair, Google or Facebook. Right? The first party is like 
near time, near third time, party third party is Facebook. Facebook or Google, right? And what's interesting is that it even has a provision to say that the, the New York Times doesn't need to set a, set itself up as a publisher or as a, uh, sorry as an advertiser. You can rely on Google as an advertiser as long as they operate as a service provider. So Google would essentially shift from a third party cross-site tracking service to essentially Amazon Web Services, where they would silo the, your, your data only for the New York Times, and that data is not intermixed with data from the Washington Post, nor is it intermixed with data from uh, Google.com itself. Right? And that's kind of the, f the framework of the law and that the way it's structured. Um, and I think you know, the AG will enforce that. So to the degree that you're concerned about enforcement, that's the, you know, kind of that's the, the hook of the law. Um, and from a competition standpoint, one last piece is unlike GDPR, the, the opt-out provision exists in the browser. So you can essentially, um, uh, so you can, once a consumer opts out, it will opt out uniformly across all publishers or all sites. Doug. So I, this question, I think, is for Dana in the first instance. Um, let's grant that, that Facebook and Google have monopoly power or a lot of market power, whatever you want to call it. Um, and um, imagine that they have two ways of uh, taking advantage of this, of this power. One is by charging uh, the, the monopoly dollar price. And the other is by engaging in a barter transaction in whole or in part in which they get information from advertisers or from users. Leave aside the possibility that price discrimination is easier in barter. That's a technical complication. Just leave that aside. One would think that if they choose barter, rather than exercising their power for cash, it's because the value to them of the information is greater than the cost to the user of giving it up. And if that's true, that that would be a wealth enhancing and efficient transaction compared to the alternative of being an ordinary monopoly charging monopoly prices. I suspect you don't agree with that, and my question is, why is barter, and this, uh, given those assumptions, worse than simply exercising the market power by charging a cash price? Well, I, I, sorry, Doug, can you, can you repeat the question? What do you, yeah, I'm not following. Oh, I'm sorry, okay, I'll try <laughs> it again. I'll, I'll see if I can do it in different words now. Um, it, it would, it, if you imagine a normal monopoly charges a monopoly price, and we worry about that, but th that's yeah. a straightforward issue. Um, the focus in this panel, appropriately given the topic, has been on, on the implications of data, and you put it in terms of exercising market power, and, and I take it they do that because instead of asking for a cash price, they're asking in whole or in part for a barter trade. They're saying pay us in information instead of cash. Right. I assume they're doing that because the value of the information is greater to them than the amount of cash they could get from the user, right. which probably means it's greater than what the user believes is the cost to it of giving up the data. And if, that, if all that's true, it looks like the barter is an efficient and welfare enhancing transaction compared to letting the monopolist do the ordinary thing monopolists do, which is discharging a high cash price. I okay. suspect you don't agree with that, and my question is why not? Well, um, I'm not sure if I'm going to, I'm not sure if I'm answering that question, but First of all, we, we don't have any market mechanism that currently exists from a technological perspective that allows users to sell their data. So we, we just don't have that mechanism that exists. And I might analogize to, for example, um, competition in the television or the cable industry. Like, you know, the, the user is paying constant price, but competition is happening on the number of ad minutes that are served per hour, right? And so the, the extraction of monopoly power, even in that situation, is, is putting more ad minutes. Does that answer your question? Yeah, the lack of mechanism, but then you also just have like market history to measure like what was the barter for the first 10 years, you know, and you have all this empirical data of consumer preference and consumer resistance and the market mechanism working and restraining, you know, this type of exchange and then the barter, you know, skyrockets to, you know, from we take your data based on what you use on Facebook to now we take your data based on what you use on 8 million, like, 
you know, so that's sort of the hockey stick and the barter equation as well. Just a, well, fortunately, we are, oh, this is a quick question, a oh, quick comment. Th this, this issue is going to come to light in light of the California law for one key provision. As I said, it allows consumers to opt out, request a publisher, for example, to not sell their data. But the decision was made not to deny a consumer service. So in that context, if you request a publisher not sell your data, the publisher can charge you to still use the good, except in the, in the law it requires that the publisher charge you what the value it gets from the sale of your data and articulate that uh, to the AG. So the, the publisher will be required if it charges on consumers' data to articulate what that value of that data is, which will then have some insights in the marketplace in terms of uh, kind of what, the, what, what they get from the sale of data versus what they make uh, from the use of the data first party. Great, thank you very much. We're out of time, unfortunately. Um, yeah.